<laughs> Welcome to Orbit 12.12. .12. I'm Carrie Ann. This is Sarah. And with us today is Dr. Kirby Runyon. Now, Dr. Kirby Runyon is the planetary geologist or a planetary geologist from John Hopkins University. He also contributes to Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, New Horizons, and the upcoming Mars 2020 rover. Is there another thing that you don't do, for heaven's sakes? Yeah. Uh, did you have Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter on there? I did. Yep. MRO, oh, LRO, okay. New good. Horizons, which is kind of what we're looking for an yeah. update for uh, today. And then upcoming Mars 2020, which I'm sure we'll probably get questions in our chat room about and as well. And a mission that doesn't exist yet, Interstellar <gasps> Probe. Yeah. It's a concept. It's not a real mission, but okay. I'm just teasing you with that for now. Okay. So many questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you've previously been on the show. You've actually yeah. been previously on our science show, which mm -hmm. was really amazing. And, you know, thank you for coming back for, with that. Um, and at the time, as you mentioned uh, off before camera, before we were rolling, you mentioned that uh, we were about T minus one month away from passing by Ultima Thule, yeah. which was on January 1st of this year, right? Yeah. Um, and we were really excited about that. And we've now done that. And so now that you have happened. an update. We have an update. Yay! Yes. <laughs> so what's happened since then? Yeah, so since then. So I was last on the show December 1st, which is T minus one month and counting yeah. from Closest Approach. Oh, perfect. Closest Approach happened at 12.33 a.m. East Coast time on New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. So we literally had this party at Johns Hopkins APL, where the spacecraft is designed, <laughs> built, and flown for NASA. And we, we welcomed in the new year, and mm -hmm. then we kind of like reset, got psyched up again for 33 minutes later for closest approach to the furthest explored world ever in the solar system by a spacecraft. Amazing. 2014 MU69 Ultima Thule. And so the spacecraft flew past Ultima Thule, and I have a model of, ah. the, of Ultima Thule right here. Yay! <laughs> and so the spacecraft flew past at over 14 kilometers per second mm -hmm. uh, at about 3,000 kilometers distance, okay. which, so for perspective, that's like flying up the west coast of the United States mm -hmm. from, say, San Diego to Seattle, looking over at Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. 3,000 kilometers away, and being able to map the distribution of buildings around the mall of the Capitol. Wow, and we were able to do that. We were able to do that, yeah. That's crazy. It's, and we were still three times closer <laughs> than we were to Pluto when we flew past Ultima Thule. Nice. All right. And so the data has been trickling in at about one kilobit per second yeah. since then. <laughs> That's one fifty-sixth the speed of dial-up yeah. internet, for those of you who remember the 1990s. But there was a really good reason for that. Right, because we have a 15-watt <laughs> transmitter and we're four billion miles away. Yeah, and it, you had to choose between speed and weight, right? So it was like, do we get everything really fast? Do we have fast? this huge dish on the spacecraft yeah. that weighs so much and it slows us down, we can get stuff instantly? Yeah. Or do we just take advantage of the fact that this is like a multi-decade long mission and we can just trickle the data in? So we did that, of course. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> and so we've gotten now all of the high resolution images back that we're going to get back from the spacecraft. Really? We're still gonna be getting data back through uh, toward the second half of, of 2020. Okay. Um, but a lot of that's gonna be other types of data. Um, but the images are back and we've analyzed the images <laughs> and they're juicy. And so we actually have some graphics of what um, some of the uh, uh, close-ups of Ultima Thule look like that uh, two of the cameras on the spacecraft took. Okay. There's like two really good cameras for like visual images. One mm -hmm. is LORI, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager. Yeah. So uh, the, the bottom here shows um, just kind of the, the very geology we have across Ultima Thule. Mm. Um, so we found out, of course, that it's, it's two lobes kind of stuck together. We've nicknamed uh, the bigger lobe Ultima and the smaller lobe Thule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And along the Terminator, where the sun's kind of at low angle, you can see a bunch of uh, craters. Mm -hmm. Now, we actually don't know geologically if those craters are formed from impacts, which is kind of the normal way we think about cratering mm -hmm. in the solar system, or they could also be formed from sublimation as that solid turns right into a gas and kind of explodes a pit there. Oh, sure. Um, I should mention with impact cratering, it's really slow. It's only about 300 meters per second way out here in the solar system. That's about 700 miles an hour, but that's compared to like mm, 50,000 miles per hour uh, for the inner solar system. So these are pretty slow impacts. Right. Um, another way you can make craters is actually where you have two geologic faults. This is in Iceland. This is where two blocks of crust are moving away from each other. Yeah. And as it does that, it opens up these underground voids and rocks oh. and debris can fall down into that and it forms a circular hole that looks like a crater. Of course, when you play with sand at the beach and you, yeah. you just pick up a bunch of it and it slowly leaks out between your hands, it forms little circular pits. Exactly, so, the, oh so, so probably these <laughs> things here are probably pit craters. These might be impact or sublimation craters. But kind of when you look at the overall structure of Ultima, and there's another graphic of uh, showing a different, different perspective of the body when we can show that, but you kind of see this rolling landscape across mm -hmm. both Ultima and Thule. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think it kind of looks like monkey bread. Like <laughs> you, yes. you make monkey bread with like lumps of dough and you stick it together. Ah. And 
Um, so this is actually an animated GIF I want to show, but um, it shows kind of the broad overall landscape. And yeah, there we go. This is this oh, is wow. beautiful. So you you've got this really amazing rolling terrain here, um, and this could be hinting at how Ultima Thule came to be built four and a half billion years ago. Because this is a frozen time capsule from them. So the planets were forming four and a half billion years ago. You had, we think, well, there were pebbles that would clump together. Um, and as they got more gravity, uh, they would pull in more pebbles and, and so on and so forth until you got all these clumps kind of slowly sticking together until you got bigger and bigger clumps. Okay, now this animation here, I'll talk more about that in a minute, <laughs> but I love this picture because it just shows this really cool kind of 3D perspective of what this tiny world looks like. It's only like 33, 35 kilometers in the long direction here, hmm. but there's only two spacecraft images that make this up. Everything else is tweened uh -huh. between there or like interpolated. Sure, so, yep. uh, and this was done by citizen scientist Roman Kachenko who posted this to the forum unmannedspaceflight.com. Wow. And so he, he did a beautiful job. Did that on his own. Did that on his own. We want to give him all the credit we can. <laughs> um, but like, but the, the rolling landscape that you could sort of see from those pictures mm -hmm. uh, seems to be highly suggestive of this formation scenario here that's been sketched out by James Tuttle Keen. James is both a space artist and he's a PhD planetary geophysicist uh, <laughs> just up the road at Caltech. Oh, nice. Of course. Yeah, and so he's on the team, and um, both to sketch cool pictures <laughs> and to do geophysics. Yeah. And so he's done both. And so what we think happened with the formation of Ultima Thule four and a half billion years ago is that we got these pebbles kind of streaming together to form all these bodies. Um, there would have been a slight rotation to the whole cloud of pebbles, and mm -hmm. so there, these things would have been rotating a little bit. Some of the later graphics show how um, these pebbles would later uh, have been cleared out. Um, and as these two lobes approached each other, they would approach each other by dumping their speed into the pebbles that were around them. Mm. So they'd be gravitationally be like, ah ya and like <laughs> <laughs> scattering pebbles away from the center of, of gravity of the system. Right. And as they did that, they got a little closer together, a little closer together. Right. Until they kind of, there we go. This is the picture that shows oh. that, yeah. Oh, okay. and so. Um, as right. the, the gravity from these two, from Ultima and Thule. So as, as this goes away, as stuff like that the whole goes away. system loses energy. Yeah, so, so as okay. these get scattered gotcha. away, these two things creep closer and closer together right. until they collide at a colossal like one meter per second. <laughs> so that's, that's two miles an hour. You can simulate this at home by walking into a wall. <laughs> Interesting. We encourage everyone to do physics at home. Right? <laughs> so uh, Rebel in our chat room says, do the tendencies, or do the trenches show where the larger blobs, for lack of a better term, I suppose, uh, have f fused together? Maybe friction welding, friction stir welding-ish. Uh, friction stir welding-ish is getting awfully specific, but uh, <laughs> the trenches, yes, that's, that's one uh, very plausible hypothesis for the trenches, is that it could be these uh, kind of cracks between the lumps of monkey bread dough yeah. uh, showing where they came together. So that's probably the leading hypothesis Interesting. Uh, for that. Yeah, exactly. So, and, that, and that was one of the telltale signs that maybe that's how this happened. Interesting. Uh, oh. There's another question in the chat room that uh, that brings to mind. Uh, Stuart Ellis, too, on, off of YouTube says, is this maybe how the moon was formed? Mm. So the moon, we don't think the moon formed exactly like this. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the initial planets probably formed from things like Ultima Thule forming, and then lots and lots and lots of Ultima Thule's <laughs> getting together and crashing together sure. and forming larger and larger worlds. Nice. Um, the moon, we think, is more of an evolved body where another planet that's been posthumously named Thea, mm -hmm. about the size of Mars, um, possibly formed at this gravitational equilibrium point between the proto-Earth and the Sun. So this would be one of the Lagrangian points mm -hmm. some of the viewers might know about. <laughs> and so there would have been this really relatively slow collision between the two planets, proto-Earth and Thea. Mm -hmm. That would have spalled off a bunch of material that we think coalesced to form the moon. We think. Interesting. The model right. seemed to suggest that. So not exactly how the moon formed, but in general how planets form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, the, the composition of Ultima Thule is really <laughs> similar. So when we flew past Pluto in 2015, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we saw that there was this dark equatorial kind of belly band around mm -hmm. Pluto. We, mm -hmm. we named it uh, Cthulhu Regio mm -hmm. from the Lovecraft uh, yes. series. Yeah. You'll love it. And it's this really dark reddish brown yeah. material. Pluto also has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. There's also a lot of methane in Ultima Thule. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of methane in general in the Kuiper Belt, this region of small planets and things like Ultima Thule beyond Neptune. And so we think what happens and we're, is that ultraviolet light from the sun and stars uh, causes, uh, they're called photolytic reactions with the methane, and it ends up forming these really big uh, um, organic molecules. Not organic, meaning life or anything like that, mm -hmm. but just made out of carbon and yeah. some nitrogen. 
and it forms this stuff. Um, it, it'd be kind of like oily coal dust, sort of. This um, organic gunk that, when you make it in the laboratory, we call it tholins. Okay. Which is a cool word. It tholins. is a cool word. It's also highly toxic, we think. Oh, oh. oh no, we know Yay. it is highly toxic. Um, <laughs> and the, basically, the surface of Ultima Thule is just basically covered in, in tholin, we think. Interesting. So, um, is Ultima Thule also reddish? It is very reddish, yeah. Oh, um, uh -huh. yeah. I think so, the only other thing yeah. I've ever seen is like black the, and white or gray. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about there. that. But it's no. about the same color as the Cthulhu Regio, the dark okay. part around Pluto. Ha -ha. Interesting. I love it. Yeah, that's around really, the really planet cool. Pluto. <laughs> that's that's really fascinating. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, all right, so I, I was going to say, uh, looking at Ultima Thule, it's pretty smooth. Uh, they, you know, I mean, impact crater-wise, you mm -hmm. see bodies about the same size in the asteroid belt and closer into us. They, they look really pocked. The moon yeah, is really pocked, a... but the stuff out there. Uh, no, isn't. that's a great question. Yeah, um, <laughs> Ultima Thule is relatively smooth and uncratered. Yeah. Now that could be for a few reasons. One of those reasons might be um, maybe craters form at the same rate, but they get erased very quickly. Like mm -hmm. geologic process could erase them. That's probably not true, uh -huh. actually, because uh, we think this is r relatively frozen and unchanged from the early solar system. But probably what it means is there's just not that many small impactors out in the Kuiper Belt. So there's not many things to make those small craters, probably. Probably. <laughs> Interesting. Do you, do you think ahead. that's because everything just sort of coalesced and, or, or do you have any idea why that might be? Off the top of my head, I, I don't think I could give a, a good reason why there aren't lots of smaller things. I don't mm -hmm. think we know. We just, and just this is consistent with, with crater counting on Pluto and its right. big moon Charon is the relative not as many small craters. So that's a mystery for, if you can solve that, I'm sure someone will give you a PhD in planetary science. Yes, all right. Just hand it over. <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Give me, right now, let's do this. That's funny. <laughs> so uh, Rebel in our chat room says, would uh, the spinning speed of the flatter part maybe explain why it didn't go to form a more round object? The spinning speed of the flatter part, okay. Hmm. Um, I don't know that we really know why it's flat like this. Mm -hmm. um, there are other small flat worlds of comparable size in the solar system, and those are some of like the really small moons of Saturn, hmm. like Pan, mm. Atlas, Phoebe, mm -hmm. and a lot of those are flattish because they've been slowly accumulating ring material from orbiting in Saturn's rings, and that sort of makes this big skirt. Um, so the thinness may be a reflection of how the large lobe Ultima may have accreted. It may be an indication of some of the original spin that was, or angular momentum that was in the system. So yeah, things would have preferentially accreted kind of along one direction of that or so. Um, Nice. Yeah. That's so, awesome. So what we've what we've shown is that hey, we this is what this type of world looks like from here on, you know, for the first time. Mm -hmm. What's really important is that this is you know it's two lobes, it's bilobate, and we see comets, um, especially Comet 67P that the Rosetta spacecraft uh, visited back starting in 2014, mm -hmm. and that's kind of two lobes, but it also makes a lot of passes into the sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Comet 67P does, and so a lot of material sublimates, it's very geologically evolved, and so Ultima Thule might be showing us kind of the original state for some of these things that they can get, uh, if when they get knocked into the inner solar system by interactions with giant planets, mm -hmm. they could evolve into things that we see like 67P. So we're seeing probably a pristine state for bilobate comets, and this, so this is still the first class of object we've ever seen like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> You mentioned before the show we were talking about how uh, we were talking about the fantastic uh, 3D printed model that you brought, which is really amazing, sitting on these tables that we have dubbed moon tables. So I, I was just <laughs> overjoyed about that, just in general. Um, and you talked about how uh, this is the most accurate model you have, but that there had been others previous. And yeah. at one point you thought it might be trilobal. What was the word you used? Well, we were kind of kicking around some ideas before before New Horizons actually got to Ultima Thule. Mm -hmm. We were staring at it with uh, our Lori camera, and we were seeing how bright it was and plotting its brightness as a function of time. Mm -hmm. When you normally do that with things in the solar system, you see that brightness vary over time, and that's a reflection of it spinning. Sure. As it's spinning, it's, it's presenting different faces to the camera, mm. and so the brightness goes up and down. Well, we really didn't see much of a variation in brightness, and it was possible that maybe it was had the spin axis pointed right at the spacecraft, so we never saw anything like change, mm. as opposed to like like that, you would see something change. Sure. Um, but one way we found out we, you could get a flat light curve was if you had three lobes stuck together is sort of a sort of a triangle thing. Interesting. Um, without having to have the axis pointed right at the spacecraft. Sure. So that 
that was one solution that ended up not being the case. We know it's by low bait, but that was just um, kind of a working hypothesis that we had that we later disproved. So science at work. We had a hypothesis, we tested it, we were wrong. Yeah, so, <laughs> love it. That's but, but so it was great. Fun. And actually, someone made that out of clay. I 3D scanned it and then 3D printed it to make it bigger. So I have all these like fake Ultima Thule models of what it doesn't look like, <laughs> but that what we thought it might possibly look like early on. That's yeah. so great. And uh, and uh, right after the flyby, when we first got our first images back. Um, uh, graduate student Mallory Kinchik on the team, mm -hmm. um, who's a graduate student at North Carolina at um, NC State, North Carolina State University. Uh, she actually used styrofoam balls and clay and wooden dowels and made like very artistically a model of what we thought Ultima Thule looked like. And it was a great first pass. And we actually 3D scanned it. And then some of the <laughs> geophysicists and astronomers used the 3D scan of that digitally in some of their like thermal evolution models and uh, gravitational uh, attraction models and things. So we actually huh. used that initial clay model for science. Now, um, we've since realized that Ultima Thule has a slightly flatter shape. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that first kind of spherical model was it was a good first pass of that. Yes. Plus, I just love the intersection of science and art. Yeah, oh, yes. it was just really satisfying to have like a very arts and crafts thing speak to what's out beyond Neptune. Yeah, it sounds like you got a lot of that on the team. I want to come back to that in just one second. Yeah. But the and what we found out eventually was the reason for the like even light curve was that uh, New Horizons turns was, out. Mm -hmm. Turns out. The, the Ultima Thule uh, was rotating with its axis pointed pretty straight <laughs> on to the spacecraft. Similar. So, hmm. Similar to the way we passed Pluto, huh? Very similar, yeah. All these worlds are tipped over on their side in the outer <laughs> solar system, which is kind of funny. Yeah, I wonder if we picked just to the two bodies that happen to be similarly oriented, or maybe there is a pattern, an overarching... Could be. Of... You know, we'll have to fly by more Kuiper Belt objects to find out. <laughs> okay, NASA. <laughs> We're doing it. Let's go back. <laughs> That's so, hilarious. Um, that brings me to another topic. Uh -huh. yes. I had teased you with Interstellar Probe yes. uh -huh. at the beginning of this, and we have a poster uh, to show. That's the really and, pretty one. Um, it's a really pretty purpley one. And so Interstellar Probe is a concept study mm -hmm. that um, APL, Johns Hopkins APL, is doing for NASA right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not a real mission. We haven't committed to doing it. We're just looking at the feasibility. You know, don't get your hopes too up, but it's Throwing like, it it's there. really cool. Okay. Yeah. Hey, NASA. So <laughs> first of all, it's not a starship. Aw. Yeah. But okay. it would be our first deliberate dipping our toe into the waters of the galaxy. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the Voyagers, Voyager 1 and 2, have exited the solar system, the heliosphere. They are now in interstellar space, mm -hmm. but they weren't designed for that. Okay. Right. And they're losing power, and they've got instruments from the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So interstellar probe would aim to go at least three to four times faster than New Horizons. Interesting. Really mm -hmm. fast, in an attempt to get out of the solar system as fast as possible to study the very local interstellar medium, the stuff between the stars. Like, this is like first order, like Captain Picard style exploration. Totally. Okay. So, one, how fast is New Horizons going? So we can multiply that by three or four. Right. right? So, <laughs> New Horizons is going 14 How fast is that? Right? <laughs> That's 14 kilometers per second. Yeah. Right. Which is three times the Earth Sun distance per year. So, three astronomical units or three AU per year. Okay. Okay. That's New Horizons. Right. So, we want to go between nine to 12, maybe 15 astronomical units per year. Oh, that's okay. Crazy. For that's comparison, scary. Pluto is about 33 AU from the sun. Mm -hmm. And you did that nine we years. We did that nine and a half years. Yeah. Um, Ultima Thule is 43 or so AU from the sun. Uh -huh. um, and so Interstellar Probe would be going, it could get that, it could go that distance mm -hmm. uh, in just like three or four years. Huh. So <gasps> there it is. There's the poster, ah! yes. Um, <laughs> So this, this is a, <laughs> we have a great logo. Um, humanity's <laughs> first step into interstellar space, interstellar probe. The idea, now here's where rocket science gets really easy. If you want to go really, really fast, uh -huh. you can have a really, really tiny lightweight spacecraft uh -huh. and put it on the biggest rocket you have. Uh huh. I mean, yes. And go really, really fast. <laughs> yeah. We uh -huh. kind of did that with New Horizons. New Horizons weighs, I think it's, let's see, 473.3 kilograms dripping wet. And we we launch because it it's amazing. soaking wet out in the outer solar system. It's hydrazine, dripping wet with hydrazine. <laughs> to be fair. Fuel tanks. Ooh. And we launched it at, on the beefiest version of the Atlas V rocket. We had five uh, strap-on solid rocket boosters on the Atlas V. Oh wow, yeah. And that thing just that rocket thought it was launching empty. And if you compare <laughs> video of that Atlas V launching New Horizons with an Atlas V launching like a, a military reconnaissance satellite, mm -hmm. the reconnaissance one just kind of like lumbers off the pad, and New Horizons just shoots up. <laughs> So the idea is so to um, 
use maybe like an SLS, the Space Launch System rocket, okay. SLS Block 1B that mm -hmm. has the uh, exploration upper stage if that ever happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And then put a New Horizons massed spacecraft on top of it. Huh. And shoot it toward Jupiter uh -huh. to get a gravity assist. So that yep. would be the, the second one on t to the right here, the SLS Block 1B. Mm. Now, if SLS never flies or it only flies a couple times before the program gets canceled, all's not lost. There are other suppliers of, of big rockets. Um, <laughs> we could potentially launch. There's a lot of big rockets out yeah. there. So we could potentially Something. do like two launches of like a Falcon Heavy, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm. We could do possibly a launch of a, um, I guess it's called the Falcon Super Heavy now. Mm. Uh, you could potentially launch on a Blue Origin new Armstrong rocket, potentially. Oh, yeah. But these are just some ideas of some of the right. giant rockets coming along yeah. that could make us go really, really fast. And I mentioned doing a gravity assist by Jupiter to pick up speed. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. We're going to take... A, we want to take a solid rocket booster with us all the way to Jupiter oh. and light that rocket at closest approach. <laughs> light that candle. Huh. So this is a Northrop Grumman Innovation System Star 48 BV solid rocket motor. Nice. And the idea is to attach one of these to interstellar probe and to light it at closest approach to Jupiter. So you're doing two things. Uh -huh. You're using Jupiter's gravity and angular momentum to slingshot you out of the solar system really fast. Uh -huh. And you're burning a lot of fuel really close to Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. And that combination, which has never really been done before like this, would get us out of the solar system really fast. Basically huh. what they do in Star Trek to go back in time. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> wow. Um, but one great thing about Interstellar Probe is that it would use all current technology. We don't mm -hmm. have to invent the next big thing to go do it. Yeah, right? no, this idea great. has been around since 1960, almost mm -hmm. 60 years. Yeah. And every time someone has done a study, they're like, well, we need to invent this thing. And like, well, well then we need to invent this other thing. And it keeps going on down the road. Right. Let's just do it. This so is we... sounding really similar to Voyager, uh, Voyager 1's path. Yeah. So are you going to be a sort And Voyager 1 sort of went through the... The, it took the short route out of the heliosphere. Yes. Would you be following that path as well? I'm so glad you asked that. We'd be following, not in that exact path, but mm -hmm. pretty close. Yes. So <laughs> uh, the sun, like other stars, and we have a graphic for this, has what's called an astrosphere mm -hmm. around it, which I just love that word. <laughs> That's a great word. We call it, for us, it's the heliosphere because it's mm -hmm. the sun. But pretty much all stars Bubble. have this. And it's the bubbles blown <laughs> in interstellar space by the winds coming off of these stars. So can you tell us what we're looking at? Yeah, so these are astrospheres around different stars within our own so, galaxy. So uh, we're looking at like this, these are the, called the bow shocks mm -hmm. around these stars. And it's the wind these stars are encountering as they're plowing through okay. the gas uh, in the galaxy. So the star itself is blowing a little bubble in yep. here. Yep. And then this stuff is sort of the interstellar medium getting... Yep, it's coming along and flowing along the outside. Yeah. It. This one has just a really long tail that's light years long. We commentary. don't know. We don't know what ours looks like. We don't know what the sun's astrosphere looks like. Right. And we could actually image it by getting outside of it. Which brings me to my next question: What instruments would be on oh, so your glad. interstellar okay. probe? Okay. <laughs> so, to 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 do a lot of this, we'd have magnetometers to study how mm -hmm. the magnetic field around the sun changes and how that gives way to the magnetic field in the galaxy. Right. Um, one instrument that I'm excited about is something called an ENA camera, an energetic neutral atom camera. Okay. So mm -hmm. normal cameras use photons of light to make up images. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to be using, instead of photons, just atoms, not ionized atoms, neutral atoms. And there are these series of plates with electric charges on them to get rid of all the charged stuff so only the neutral stuff can come in uh -huh. and you can focus that. And you can actually make an image. We've done that from Earth orbit looking out what? and we've discovered this strange ribbon of energetic neutral atoms coming at us kind of off the front of the heliosphere, where the direction we're plowing into the galaxy, mm -hmm. a little bit off that, to, I guess to be the starboard bow. Um, <laughs> and so um, we've seen that. We don't know what it is, but it's, if you could see in atoms mm -hmm. instead of seeing in photons, there'd mm -hmm. be this bright, bright patch in the sky. Interesting. And we, wanna, we think it makes sense to go through that, to see what the heck that is. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Figure out what that is, and then once we get into interstellar space, both kind of study the particles and the fields out there, uh, look back at the heliosphere with the ENA camera, mm -hmm. but now here's where the planetary geologist gets happy, <laughs> is yep. on the way out of the solar system, mm -hmm. we got to fly through the Kuiper belt. Mm -hmm. yeah, you do. And <laughs> Pluto is one of about 125 or so similarly sized planets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These small planets don't get any attention, and they're so cool. So one such planet <laughs> that's about <laughs> half the size of Pluto, called Quayoar, 
That's how you pronounce it. Yes, Quayar. Oh my god. Oh, there she Here is. Here it is. <laughs> these are shown, these are the Kuiper Belt planets we've explored shown to scale. Now Triton used to be a planet in the Kuiper Belt that has since been captured by Neptune and is now its largest moon. Mm -hmm. We flew past it in 1989. Of course, there's Pluto, which is slightly smaller than Triton, and Pluto's satellite planet Charon. Mm -hmm. And it's really a double planet system because there's two planets orbiting a point in the middle. Mm -hmm. Quayar is about the same size as Charon. Of course, we don't know what its surface looks like. Right. Um, another one I happen to put on here is Chaos, but there's, there's tons funny. of these small planets out here. <laughs> um, and uh, we know from telescopes on Earth that Quayar uh, has lots of fresh methane ice on the surface, which means it hasn't been space weathered. Mm -hmm. So it could have been recently emplaced by like cryovolcanoes. Pluto has some cryovolcanoes like here. We mm -hmm. think they're cryovolcanoes that would erupt mixtures of water and, and ammonia and, and methane. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the, uh, uh -huh. the interstellar pro part of this and, uh -huh. the, and the ribbon I mentioned, mm -hmm. Quayar is right in front of that ribbon. Seriously. So we could fly by Quayar, just like New Horizons flew past Pluto, mm -hmm. explore this small planet up close with regular cameras, and we'd still be in the perfect direction out of the solar system to see what this energetic neutral atom ribbon is all about, get outside the heliosphere and see what kind of astrosphere the sun has around it. And <laughs> after Quayar, we could potentially do a small trajectory correction maneuver and fly past another one of these things. Nice. Another small Kuiper Belt object. <laughs> wow. So there's so many things to make so many people happy on this mission concept. And we think if we want to do this, we want to launch by around the year 2030. Okay. Which actually means we start planning now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, so Freemason41 in our YouTube chat room says, so how long would it take to get this project going or is it already in the works? So the concept studies are already in the works. We're trying to get community buy-in from uh, different people uh, who are funded by NASA. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're interested in, in, so three of the four divisions within NASA's science mission directorate are astrophysics, mm -hmm. heliophysics, and planetary science. Mm -hmm. And this is a mission where all three of these <laughs> normally very separate spots within NASA could work together hopefully share resources, share, share money. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. That's actually harder to do than probably some of the technical stuff. Um, but this is an area where so many different types of scientists and people just interested in science could check all their boxes. This would be such an exciting mission to do heliophysics, astrophysics, and planetary science. Oh, yeah, goodness. fascinating. I got to ask Jared's question of what was the paper napkin moment on this? <laughs> I don't think there was one paper napkin moment. Like I said, this has been going since the 1960s, people talking about sure. this. But this, like you guys, have, you're putting this one together right now. You've got so, some idea that like, some nugget yeah, that sort so of Yeah, so we're working on the final report for NASA headquarters right now. And so we'll, we'll be submitting that hopefully in the next few weeks to NASA headquarters. Oh man. Huh. Uh, Vax Hedrum in our chat room says, does a nuclear thermal rocket upper stage help this mission? That's a great question. So actually, no. It doesn't. For one thing, that type of rocket has never been flown in space before. Sure. And we want to do this using current technology so that we can actually do it, dang it. No, right. that's Let's get it done. <laughs> Essentially right. off the shelf, yeah. for yeah. lack of a better. Yeah, we don't want to invent we anything to do this. Like yeah. The, yeah. the only miracle we're invoking is the, like, the SLS rocket. Huh. Right. That's yeah, the well. only thing that doesn't exist yet, or it may never oh, exist. It's a good thing Ben's um, not on right now, but yes, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Or, or Falcon Super Heavy or whatever sure, big rocket right. makes sure. sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we want to do it with, with modern technology really fast and get it done. Mm -hmm. Maybe what would be great is in the 2040s, invent all the new things, the nuclear thermal rockets, the uh, kilowatt uh, nuclear reactors in space and go and like to pass interstellar probe on the way. Like, if we could do right, that, right, right. great. <laughs> but if that never happens, st still, this is going to be sure. great. For sure. Well, so then uh, Citizen 48390 asks, why not light sails? Uh, again, um, those have never been used to accelerate faster than we can do with chemical or ion rockets. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so pretty much all of the propulsion technologies you could think of, uh, nuclear electric propulsion, uh, solar electric propulsion, thermal nuclear rockets, throwing atom bombs out the end and detonating them, mm -hmm. all those other solar sails, none of those are mature enough technology to do it now. And actually, the spacecraft would have to be so lightweight for like a solar sail, you wouldn't be able to put many cool science instruments on there. That's fair. So, so it's like, it, the idea is for this to be a pragmatic and practical interstellar probe. Totally. Yeah. Totally, totally. But not to squash on anyone wanting to dream about future yeah. technology. That no. needs to happen too. No, that's but fantastic. But we also need to do with yeah. current technology what we can. Yeah. And the chemical rocket, the, the solid uh, rocket booster at the Jupiter mm -hmm. um, gravity assist, yeah. that, that'll get you more speed than having an ion drive? Yes. Really? Yes. We, we've, had, we've had the engineers and the physicists work these numbers, and that's actually faster than the ion engine. Wow. So this is the fastest way we know how to get out of the solar system. Okay. Interesting. So, and so 
Big rockets and gravity assists. Okay. Right, right. So it took Voyager 1 uh, from 1977 mm -hmm. to 2012 to make it to the heliopause. Yeah. How fast would this do it? Okay, so if, if the heliopause is at 120 astronomical units and you're traveling at 10 AU per U, that's, that's 12 years, mm -hmm. which is the same time it took New Horizons to get to Ultima Thule about. Um, Oh, man. So, so real, and we'd get to Quayawar so, in, that's 44 AU, so like in four years. So we would be looking at getting <laughs> energetic neutral particle pictures of the interstellar medium by 2042? Yeah, about there. And they'd be getting better later. So one thing I forgot to mention that's really cool is that the prime mission for this would be 50 years. Ha. And so Voyager <laughs> is at 42 years, so yeah. this is not unprecedented. No. Right. But RTGs are amazing. RTGs are amazing. And we just use regular <laughs> plutonium dioxide powered RTGs, just regular, yeah. we already have this technology. Yeah. We actually, uh, the newer RTGs actually in some ways aren't as good as some of the older RTGs like what uh, Voyager New Horizons had. In what way? Uh, the thermocouples, what, uh, mm -hmm. the electrical junction that takes the heat difference between cold space and the hot plutonium yeah. mm -hmm. and makes that into electrical current, those, those break down faster than the plutonium runs out. Are we hmm. cutting corners? What was happening? I don't know the details, um, but uh, the, the type of RTG that New Horizons has is the type we want in terms of the thermocouples. You use the older we, we'd version? We want to use the older version, actually, Cause yeah, because that's the that's limiting factor more than the plutonium. Wow. And hmm. um, yeah, so again, just using regular technology to go faster and further than anyone. And this is the type <laughs> of exploration. Faster, further, higher, better is what really you know yeah. turns my crank. Mars is great. <laughs> We've been there so many times, yes. and it's, we no longer like, what does Mars look like? Right. Yeah. Like, we know what Mars yeah. looks like. Those questions, we're, we're asking more detailed questions now on Mars, and that's fine and right and proper. Yeah. But the really exciting thing is, we don't even know what Quayawar looks like. Sure. Right. Let's go see what it looks like. Yeah. And all the other small planets. We, that was the same thing with Pluto. Um, when we were uh, getting close to it in 2015, we thought it might look a lot like Triton. Mm -hmm. And so I was a graduate student at the time on the mission, and so they had me print out this giant poster of <laughs> Triton from the Voyager 2 flyby, yeah. and we're getting ready to analyze geologic features on Pluto that we think would be similar to Triton, like these um, black smoking uh, mm -hmm. chimney plumes coming up off the surface of Triton, and these weird double ridge expansion joints, and um, this cantaloupe terrain of sublimation. We didn't see any of that on Pluto. Yeah. Mm. And so there's just all these geologic surprises for these tiny planets out there uh, in Pluto's neighborhood. Interesting. Uh, Theron in our, in our <laughs> chat room asks, in which class would this mission be? Like Discovery, New Frontiers, Flagship? Well, it would, it breaks the yes. paradigm. It, so all those, that's a great question. All those categories are only within NASA's planetary science division. Sure. The uh, heliophysics and the astrophysics missions have different names for their missions. Interesting. I don't know what they are. Okay. And this would be a cross-divisional mission. So, yeah. um, my employer, the Johns Hopkins APL, we've had a track re record of inventing mission categories. I love it. <laughs> so New Horizons was the first in the New Frontiers missions of about a billion dollars. Right. Uh, in the late 1990s, the Near Shoemaker mission, the first uh, mission to orbit and land on an asteroid, mm -hmm. um, was the first in the Discovery series. Hmm. And so Interstellar Probe might be the first mission in a new class to be invented around it. Huh. So we're, we're breaking paradigms here, cutting down walls. <laughs> By yes. using existing technology. I love it. Yeah. This is, I, I love outside the box thinking totally. and repurposing of, of existing materials. Yeah. Because it means it can happen now. Yes, we can do this now. Um, <sighs> just, just takes money. Uh, sure, but Isn't I mean, once you start away. eliminating, you know, time, R &D, money, yeah. R&D, yeah, you start eliminating the, the yes. holdbacks, it means it makes it more possible right. sooner. And because these products are already made, you can go to the people that make them and say, let's make this happen. Sure. It's yeah. more, more business for you. You don't have to do anything. So think about be. how inspirational this is too. Yeah. For, for people in undergrad or high school right now, yeah. thinking about careers they want to have, they'd be like, well, so there's a mission that might launch if it happens in 2030 on a 50 year mission. Mm -hmm. that, that's a career length mission. Yeah. Right. We're already planning. We actually have a sociologist on the team, um, Janet Vertesi, who studies planetary scientists. Huh. She doesn't study planetary science, she studies us. I <laughs> love it. The Jane Goodall of New Horizons yes, team. Yes, she is the Jane Goodall of, of planetary science. And she's like, when planetary scientists are talking about missions, they use, they use their hands to stand for spacecraft, and then they have like funerals right. when robots die. And so we would we have to have like this, um, this, this succession plan of passing the baton 
uh, down from like principal have new principal investigators and new project scientists mm -hmm. to, to aid in leadership over the decades of a mission like this to get out of the solar system and to get as deep into interstellar space as we can. Oh my goodness. So the inspiration for someone to kind of think about, wow, I could do that. Maybe they're only in middle school right now. Yeah. But they could already start thinking about this and motivating them, not just in this country, but around the world. Interesting. So, I mean, that kind of begs the question, like, you are, no, you don't live in Southern California. You happen Sadly to be out no. here. Yep. <laughs> I know. When is that changing? But that's a different question. Uh, I love where I live, but I love California. No, that's great. Yeah, one of the reasons that you're out here is because <laughs> Yuri's Night LA is happening tonight. Yes. yes. And uh, we're all going, so why aren't you there? Um, <laughs> uh, but so that, so that's kind of the thing that I personally, that I struggle with. Okay. We talked a little bit about this before the show as well, about how like, you know, when a human is on a rocket, I get that. And a rocket brings humans, and so I get that part of it. And so all of that part makes sense to me. I'm not going to Pluto. Right. Right. Like, I'm not going up to all of these things. And I, Yet. sure, but like, <laughs> I'm old. And so I'm not getting to 2040. So like, how, <laughs> what? how and or why wow. is this, it's it's interesting. It's it's wildly fascinating. Yeah. I don't I don't want to downplay that in any way, shape, or form. But as Ben would say, why do I care? Why do you care? <laughs> no. So I don't know if you can tell. I get really passionate about <laughs> totally. this. Totally. Like and, I, I joke that you know uh, when you're excited, I'm excited. But now I want to understand why I'm excited. I want to understand why you're excited. Okay. This gets real. To me, this gets really philosophical. Sure. It's like what makes life enjoyable and worth living. Sure. And it's things that make you happy and excited and zealous and that you can sink your teeth into. Yeah. Um, for me, that's space exploration. Higher, faster, farther. Mm -hmm. With humans, yes, we need to go back to the moon and then think about going to Mars, because mm -hmm. we, we, we retreated from the high ground of the moon in 1972, yeah. the last time any astronaut's been to the moon. Mm -hmm. And so the moon is still the frontier for human space exploration. Yeah. And then thinking about Mars after that. For robotic exploration, the frontier is really Saturn and beyond, mm -hmm. and especially the Kuiper Belt and Pluto and beyond. Yeah. That's the frontier. Yeah. That's where I want to spend my personal capital investing. Now, why is this important? I think it because it makes life more enjoyable. Like, we're not the Borg in Star Trek. Like, if you look at the Borg, <laughs> like, fair. I would have an existential crisis if I was a Borg. It's like, my whole life is about being more efficient. Mm -hmm. More efficient at doing what? Metabolism? Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. They, they regenerate, and regeneration, seven of nine tells us, is more efficient than sleep. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, they don't have to invent stuff because they just assimilate other species. Um, I mean, I guess to a certain extent, uh, you know, uh, the other sort of point is that uh, with the human exploration thing, you get things, I mean, you don't get Velcro, but you do get Velcro. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you get these sort of these trickle-down effects yeah. to, our, to bettering our life mm -hmm. here on Earth. Yes. And so, cool, I send a robot out, and it takes pretty pictures for me, and I have really fantastic wallpapers now, but how does that really enhance my life here on Earth? Are you happier because you've now seen things that no human has ever seen before that are four billion miles away, taken I mean, by a spacecraft going 14 kilometers per second? I don't know about them. Some people aren't going to be, and sorry, they're just, there's no hope. But some people do get excited about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill, on my own time, talking to staffers in Congress. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell the difference between a Republican and a Democrat and an independent when you're talking about NASA's budget and you're mm -hmm. talking about sure. what NASA does. Everyone's excited about this. Yeah. There's nothing controversial, really, about this. It's like, yes, let's go do this. And what other thing in life is such an infuser of quality? Mm. So to me, that's why you do it. Yes, there's the technology spin-offs, mm -hmm. and that's a great reason to do it. To me, that's kind of a Borgish reason to do it. Well, we found a more efficient way of calling people on a telephone. <laughs> yes. Now. Like, that's a, that's a valid reason. <laughs> that's, not, that's not why we do it, though. We no, do it for sure. the same reason we do art. Mm -hmm. We do it for the same reason we play sports and other things that have no quote unquote practical benefit. You know, um, we were talking about this before the show. I have a colleague uh, who I work with very closely, I respect him. He um, started off doing some planetary science and he's doing more um, earth climate change science now, which is great, that's super important, we need to do that, we need to understand and stop and reverse climate change. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, to me, I don't have the emotional investment of excitement in that that I do in space exploration. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, great, go do the climate change science, some of us, <laughs> want to go off and explore the solar system. Um, so it takes all types. And one field inspires research in another field. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I've been involved with is studying sand dunes on other planets. Yeah. Mars, Titan, it's a satellite planet of, of Saturn. Um, and then we also think there's sand dunes on, on Pluto. I was a co-author on that paper by Matt Telfer. Mm -hmm. And 
when you and all of this research on planetary sand dunes has re-inspired new research for sand dunes on Earth, mm -hmm. which are practical because they affect land usage. Um, as climate change, there's climate change again, advances, mm -hmm. more there's aridification, deserts are growing, there's more dry sand blowing around, yeah. uh, impinging mm -hmm. on farmland and uh, affecting water usage. Mm -hmm. So you don't know how the cross-pollination is gonna happen between quote unquote useless fields of science, which I don't think are useless, and then that and then see how those uh, cross-pollinate into really practical fields of science. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Really quickly, I want to touch on Yuri's Night oh, yeah. slightly because there must be a reason that you have come uh. all the way out here to do a Yuri's Night thing. Yuri's Night, for those people who don't know, uh, is a celebration <laughs> of all things space. Yes. All things, uh, including space flight or human space flight. Uh, start Yuri's Night, of course, named for Yuri Gagarin, uh, April 12th, 1961, yeah. the very first yes. human in space. Yep. Um, so why are you at Yuri's Night? <laughs> why am I at Yuri's Night? Because yeah. I was here last year for that and it was equal parts weird and fun. Yes! <laughs> it was awesome. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's exactly what you said. It's this wonderful fusion of the arts and space and coming together. And what I passionately want is for science and space to be just part of mainstream life. Mm -hmm. yes. Like coffee pot conversations at work to just be less about politics and sports and more science and space. Mm -hmm. I want that. Totally. Yuri's Night is more of that. <laughs> this show is more of that, I feel like. Awesome. Um, and uh, our Tomorrow Show colleague, Athena Brensberger, yes. uh, got me into this, into yeah. Yuri's Night, got me into this show. Thank yeah. you, Athena. Big yes. shout out. Yay, Athena. Thank you, Athena. Um, <laughs> uh, Astro Athens. And um, yeah, so it was so much fun. I had to come back for it. I'm dressing up as Captain Jean-Luc Picard. And Not nerdy so at all. Excited. And I have a question about yes. your commitment. You mentioned earlier that you were thinking about... Shaving, shaving my head. I don't know, spoilers yeah. for anyone who's here. Like, I don't want, I'm, I'm ooh, curious spoilers. what the chat box online says. What does the internet say about me shaving my head after the show? That is a good oh, question. Oh, you don't throw it to the internet. They no. will incur. Uh, Astro YYZ automatically said, yes. not bald enough. So yes. not bald enough. <laughs> we apparently need to make that happen. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, this is a love note to Sir Patrick Stewart. Um, yes, totally. As all things should be. So uh, <laughs> where else can people find you online? Because you are just about everywhere. Mm -hmm. If people want to follow you and learn yes. more about so, what you're doing and all those uh, Twitter and YouTube are the are the main places. My Twitter handle is NASA Man 58. The 58 is 1958, the year NASA was created. Oh, I love uh, it. And so also on YouTube. I don't post that much to YouTube, NASA Man 58 there as well. Perfect. So those are the main right. ways. And then just Google my name and I've got a lot of articles and you theater. do. Holy cannoli. I found that out <laughs> earlier. That because was Because it's fantastic. all about spreading the word about space. Oh, it's great. Yeah, I love space. It's great. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Dr. Kirby Redden, you are very welcome on the show. Anytime you like space, science, I'm sure there's going to be another one in the future. Thank yep. you, Feel free to come by <laughs> right. anytime. Thanks. Uh, before we leave, though, I want to make sure I give a huge thank you to our patrons, to our uh, citizen supporters. Oh, my goodness, you guys. Uh, without you, we wouldn't have all the wonderful things that we have, including the lights, the cameras, the chairs, the Dr. Kirby Runyons, the Sarahs, the Cats, <laughs> the Duddas, the Bens, the Carrie of this world. Um, we would not be here without you. Really, really sincerely. Um, we might have a camera, but it would be very, very dark and be very, very boring. Um, and what your contribution really lets us do is have these really amazing conversations with really amazing people and finding out all kinds of fun things. Yeah. Like uh, I, I like I said earlier, I started to joke that, um, you know, like on Facebook, you have to put that cute little like so, cute little tagline about yourself kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, and mine very sincerely is I fell in love in space when I saw the excitement in your eyes. And I, I feel that all the time whenever I meet somebody who's really excited. Well, whatever you're excited about, because, you know, planetary science doesn't necessarily always speak to me. Yeah. Um, but but you certainly have changed my mind. So I, I very much appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate all of our citizens for helping us out to do that. So um, in any case, that is our show. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you next week. Bye. Blushing the you entire were. time. You were, and it was oh, adorable. But I didn't mean that. Yes. It's, it's nice. <laughs> oh, and I didn't get to bring it back to Brian May. Oh. Oh. oh that's I was just thinking that. Yep. Sorry. I needed to bring up Brian May. <laughs> yes. We can talk about Brian May. Yeah, now. right now. Did, yeah. Did you bring. Oh the, my the gosh. Did you bring rest. Brian May? That's, there, he did this really cool. He he did his first single album in forever. Yes. On New Horizons. So moved. Um, and there's this really cool music video he did with it. It's all animations of New Horizons flying around. Um, 
Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, and then, so he's actually on the science team with us. Yes. Oh, awesome. yes, he has a PhD in astrophysics. Because, you know, once you've conquered the world with Queen, then yes. what? Space. I mean, I feel like that allows you to do what you really want to do, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not that he didn't want to do music, it's, but like. It's arts and science again, yes. influencing each other. A million yeah. Perfect. percent. Um, so I, like, I fanboy around astronauts. Yep. And I fanboy around Brian. Yes. Is he the, if not more, in the office? Oh, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> And and there's emails and I'm like, mm. and so he does a lot of the he does a lot of the 3D he he does some 3D imagery. Yeah, oh, wow. um, we actually he, used some of his work yesterday at Allspace. Oh, cool! Yeah. So he has this new book out on Queen. It's like 3D <laughs> images of Queen, and it's it's a book, but you have like these 3D glasses. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool! And so he's and like this this 3D technology was invented in the 1800s of using two different photographs yes. at different angles, mm -hmm. which is way more successful, at least for my eyes, than the red green. Yeah, same. Separating same. Those uh -huh. don't work so well for me. Yeah. Um, and so he's actually worked with some of like getting 3D and like making 3D models. That's so we really have the data cool. to make something like that. Yeah. So Brian's he's such he's such a gentleman. He's so nice. Good. Um, just really. Want to bring him next time? No. <laughs> I would. <laughs>